I'm your typical futurist in that I love history. I recently had the pleasure of touring some of the oldest rock art paintings in the United States, located in West Texas. These rock paintings are dated back to 4,000 years ago, and they contain some amazing images, and that's what really motivates me to talk about sustainability. Funny enough, although I'm a futurist, 4,000 years in the past only makes me think about 4,000 years in the future. So after visiting these cave paintings, I became quite inspired to think more deeply about how a future history is created. I'll also share a future history with you later, the one we're living in now. Did you know that many large organizations such as Ford, Google, Hershey's, Intel, and Ancestry.com have job positions, some are labeled futurist, which are filled by individuals skilled in the established futurist approaches. A professional futurist can work on projects within an organization to drive strategy or independently to promote their own vision of the future. Futurists very often produce predictions, scenarios, and forecasts of 10, 20, 100 years or more. I'm always asked rather suspiciously what a futurist does exactly. It varies. The broadest thing I can say is that most futurists are known for bringing something new to the conversation. We are known for presenting unexpected viewpoints and embracing innovation. Futurists often have the tendency to influence people, to take a long-term mindset, and early identification of key opportunities or strategy is another main element of the way we think. Good futurist research and scenarios combine information we gather from intuitive as well as rational sources. Futurists transform the present by producing a completely new interpretation of the future. The futurist process involves a highly flexible and adaptive set of activities. We can address a specific strategic question or generate entirely new and creative ideas about the future. There is no wrong way of applying foresight skills, but a strong futurist needs a well-informed starting position based in evidence and facts. The best preparation is to have hunger for strategic insights and an open mind. Some projects are intended to explore different images of the future. Other times, futurology is completely focused on answering a single question. Frequently, futuring starts from having a sense of the ideal or preferred future and identifying what steps would be needed to arrive at that goal. Other times, the process is mostly about generating many different possible future scenarios. Ultimately, a futurist will take you down a path that can be exploratory or focused. An exploratory application of foresight tends to open mental pathways multiple, to multiple potential futures, while focused futures tend to work to narrow down the options toward a path to the future we want or want to avoid. How would we know? Scanning. Scanning is how we start to know the future. Scanning is one of the most regularly applied futurist techniques for knowing what's changing in ways that might impact the future. Scanning is where a futurist most resembles a trend scout and a cool hunter, which are the roles kind of common in fashion, art, design, marketing. But scanning becomes a way of life for most futurists, and it essentially involves effective use of sources to identify emerging ideas. The trend scout is one of the many hats worn by a futurist, and it's probably one of the easiest to adopt. Scanning requires reading and monitoring dozens and dozens and dozens of news and media outlets daily. Thought leaders, industry publications, conference proceedings, different Kickstarters, and all different social media content is fodder for a futurist's insatiable appetite for new information. After soaking up volumes of traditional journalistic, academic, and traditional information sources, significant strategic observations about the future can be sketched out. Recently, I've scanned information about a startup making sunglasses from plastic waste that were recovered from our oceans. Another trend that's got my attention involves a new paradigm for computing with living things like molds and fungi, those being the natural resource we use for technology devices. I'm also really interested in data points, such as the fact that IKEA is now formally selling secondhand furniture. These are all kinds of tidbits I like to have on hand for outlining future scenarios on a topic such as sustainability. Basically, we go beyond vision statements. We tap into a sort of collective consciousness, sometimes to see the path forward. 
because the visions of the future are nothing more than educated thought experiments. If you haven't guessed, visioning is the most creative part of a futurist job. This is the portion of the process where stakeholders and participants can start to collectively understand and potentially influence the future. Visioning work can be done in large or small groups or even individually. I believe our deafness at visioning can be increased with attention to mindfulness and using music, meditation, exercise, even all kinds of uplifting activities can prime the mind to explore uncharted futures. Since futurism has such universal appeal, it's not difficult to embrace its power to produce key insights and learning. The skills necessary to perform well are easy. Suspend disbelief, eliminate the word never, and appreciate that the future hinges on today's activities. For me, several big ideas have influenced and inspired my work as a futurist. One major concept that I find compelling and useful is that of the 200 year present, a fascinating idea conceived by a sociologist, Elise Golding, and of which I learned as a student of Dr. Chris Jones and Dr. Wendy Schultz at the University of Houston. Bolding provides a great example of how futurology requires unconventional perspectives. The idea is based on the premise that a 200 year span is enough to encompass the lifetimes, past and future, of the youngest and the oldest living members of society at any, at any given time and all the many social networks and connections that they touch. It's the great grandparents holding the family's newborn baby. That is what 200 years looks like one continuous, expansive present. Bolding's idea resonates with me because it provides a pathway to perform what I think is the most important obligation of the futurist profession, which is to protect future generations. By embracing important and strongly defined ideas like Bolding's 200 year present, futures work can be an act of humanitarianism, which is highly needed at every point in history, but especially now, we give stronger meaning to our work as futurists when we claim the present and the future are vast. So what does the future look like to a futurist with an eye on the cutting edge and a 200 year time horizon? To refine the question, is our way of life sustainable? How will we forge on into the future in a way that is fair to the generations ahead? Let's go to a future museum to find out. I'd like to take you on an inspirational journey, a bit of a thought experiment to explore what the future might be like on our path to sustainability over the next 100 years. I ask you to humor me and join me on a time travel trip to the future. Let's go visit a future museum in 2120 and see what we can learn about how the world has changed in terms of meeting our sustainability goals. A future museum is a powerful vision because it lets us look back at the present as a historian would. We can dissect the different aspects of the sustainability challenge by putting ourselves in the mindset of someone 100 years away. What will our ancestors learn from us by visiting a museum a century from now? Let's go. When visiting this museum of the future, the first thing we might notice is the building itself takes a completely sustainable design. This building, as I envision it, looks like a tree. There's a design philosophy known as biomimicry, which uses features and elements, attributes of the structures of nature, and they use it for engineering sustainable built products and built environments. So this building might look like a tree in the sense that it would have roots that go into the ground, for example, that seek out what the building needs to function day to day, energy, water, light. The design would ensure that it exists at a net zero or even better situation where the building gives back more to the local environment than it takes away from natural resources. Another way the building might be like a tree using biomimicry would be the leaves. It could have fixtures, light fixtures, inspired by bioluminescent organisms in the shape of leaves, lighting the exterior. And as you look up, the building could have leaf-like structures on branches that stretch into the sky made of 3D printed materials capable of responding to their environment and changing. So this building would serve like a tree to provide cooling and shade, even heating to its inhabitants and the people around it. So it could actually move and change in response to environmental stimuli, wetness, dryness, heat, coolness. It could respond 
sustainably and provide the conditions for the people using the building. And again, it would be part of the local community that never extracts more than it gives back. So that would be the first thing we might notice in a museum of the future, a design drawing on biomimicry with natural principles, such as a tree's design, idealized to maintain a balance. So the first room I might walk you into in a museum of the future could be an exhibit based on telling the story of the petroculture of the past. Petroculture, meaning fossil fuels, and referring specifically to petroleum, is the lifestyle that was built around the natural resource itself. The exhibit would say that the transition away from petroculture lifestyle started in the 2020s. Therefore, the 2020s are a notable era where the petroculture traditions, customs, the rituals, and the history begin to be transformed into important artifacts that museums may one day display to show us how far we've come on our path to sustainability. So in this exhibit, we might see, for example, a display of a life-size American family home that might have been built in the 1950s or 1970s through the early 2000s. The petrochemical movement in the built environment would be viewed as a form of architecture that 100 years from now would not be considered sustainable. So it would be a bit of a museum artifact to learn about the past and measure our evolution. Another thing we might see is a car. Future museum patrons will learn that a suburban home would have to have a combustion engine car in the garage. A hundred years from now, combustion engine vehicles are likely to have long been banned or deemed illegal all across the world. They might exist as a hobby or a leisure activity, but it wouldn't be a main form of transportation anymore. We'll probably see maybe electronic vehicles or some form of clean mass transport. Moving on to the next exhibit, what about something hands-on and interactive? A slice of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. In the early 2000s, a very large island of trash was observed in the Pacific Ocean, and it continued to grow for decades. This exhibit would explain how, finally in 2030, along with reaching the Sustainable Development Goals, the Pacific Garbage Patch was cut up into tiny pieces, small enough to ship around the world and placed in museums. So this could become an interactive exhibit for people to look at and see what had been polluting our oceans and understand how much garbage was plastic and all sorts of waste that were tampering with our ecosystems. So I would envision maybe a hands-on exhibit, something that people could touch, for example, not that you want to, it's garbage, but it would be a historic artifact to the extent of petroculture's barrier to sustainability. I would like to imagine the museum would teach about how the world's governments did something about the Pacific garbage patch. For example, breaking it up into pieces and putting it in a museum so people can see it and also look back on it and say, wasn't it great that we banned plastics in 2030? Didn't we do a good job with that? It would serve as a reminder of the types of consumption that we wish to avoid to maintain a sustainable society. Going into the next exhibit, we might actually see more than an exhibit. How about an active research center? Something that could be really valuable in a museum of the future would be a think tank composed of indigenous people and their ancestors, where they could share wisdom, knowledge, histories about how to live sustainably on the planet. Unfortunately, they will have lost much of what was once their unique knowledge through the decimation of their history. Future museums will teach that climate change put many indigenous societies at risk and made some permanently extinct. People that lived near the coast, jungles, rainforests, islands, their ways of life became endangered. So it would make sense that a museum of the future would employ sociologists, anthropologists, archeologists, all sorts of social scientists and different researchers whose job would be to understand what we're losing through climate change and why we want to preserve it. The reason for this is that in 2120, the sustainability challenge won't be over, but it will be making immense progress. It will be a long time before we strike the necessary balance for true sustainability. Another exhibit, Smart Rocks. Future museum visitors would view these primitive 1990s laptop computers built with quartz and lithium as the predecessors of their biocomputing culture. They would learn that although computers and devices that were made from rare earth minerals were toxic and very dangerous for our environment, 
and contributed to many health issues, they were universally used for decades. It sounds strange, but by 2100, it may actually be the norm to use what's called biocomputing, which is machines that are made or grown <laughs> from biological organisms, such as algae or mold, living things that we can actually use their living energy to compute with. Imagine a specially lit room with antique smart rocks, phones, laptops, computers, which are today the norm, but our descendants in 2120 compute with organic machines instead, mold, algae, mushrooms with the qualities that are required to form the basis of clean computing and communication technology, eliminating e-waste on a grand scale and reducing the need for mining of non-renewable resources from the earth. So those are some of the things that I envision we might come across in a museum of the future, if we were able to visit one in 100 years, and if we we're trying to learn about how society and organizations could take the path to a sustainable future. Thank you for joining this thought experiment. I hope it was interesting and it helps you think of different ways that we might seek that path. What else would be on display in a museum of 2120? How will the patrons look upon our lifestyle? Will they pity us? Will they say, I'm glad I wasn't alive back then? Will they think of us as wise? Can you imagine them thanking us for what we have done to ensure their survival?